Bonjour. Welcome to Wasset Citizens Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN 3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I am Bronwyn Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call the Wasset Studio at 1-800-465-7144 or 737-4017. You can always listen on the radio at 91.9 FM and also on the television at Bell Express U Channel 972. You're welcome to join me live through the Zoom link. You don't have to ask any questions or talk to me, but if you just wanna be here and watch as I teach, you're welcome to do that. The link is available from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Our classes are scheduled from three to four on Monday through Thursday uh, in the afternoons. And we are now in our seventh week of our nine week course. At this point, you definitely should have submitted some work if, um, and if you haven't, get it to me soon as our last day to submit work is June 10th, which is only a couple of weeks away. So a reminder that the key questions are listed at the end of the, of each of the IELTS lessons. So please do all of them, checking your understanding, your, the activities and the review questions are all listed at the back of each of your lessons so that you know which ones to do. Please show all of your work, your steps and your thinking to really explain what your thoughts are so I get a full understanding and make sure you're actually answering the question. You can do this by hand or electronically, either is fine with me. If you want to write in your workbook, you can, it's your workbook. The spaces are small and you want to make sure you're giving me full complete sentences and full complete ideas so I don't know if you'll have enough space but it's your call for what works for you. If you're going to do it electronically either a Word or Google Doc file is going to be the easiest thing for me to open so if you want if you can do it in that that'd be great. Uh, everyone has access to Google Docs through their NNEC email address so I can help you access that if you need to. Uh, though, if you need to use it in program because of wherever, whatever is your comfort, that's probably fine. Just let me know so that we can make sure I can open your files or we can access, I can access it in some way. There are three different ways to submit your work. The first is to scan your work and send it electronically. So if you have a smart device, you could scan using the iPhone notes app or the Android Google drive app both have fairly straightforward scan functions. I'm happy to help you if you need support with that. Though if you would prefer to just take pictures, you can do that as well. Generally pictures are just larger files and can be um, a little bit more cumbersome to work with, but it's totally fine if that's what works for you. Then you can send it to me through email at studentwork at nnec.on.ca and cch 2 bronwynslate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook Messenger where my name is B Slate Wasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sue Lookout. Uh, we have an outdoor mailbox at 74 Front Street where the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. So feel free to put it there at any time. And then the third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name Wasa. So friend me on YouTube or subscribe to my YouTube channel and then you'll get notifications every time I upload one of our lessons. All of our lessons are recorded and I upload them as soon as I can, though sometimes it takes a couple of days. All of our lessons are put on a playlist on, called SVN3E, so you can find them fairly straightforward uh, there if you go to playlists. Also within that, there is a, another playlist that's called supplementary videos where all of our videos that we watched in class are linked um, to the original sources so you can find them where they originally came from through YouTube. Science is a really visual subject so I strongly encourage you to tap into the visuals either by joining me live through Zoom or by watching the YouTube replays. 
if you can't access the replays, that's completely understandable. Just let me know and I can try to send you a copy or I can send you a copy of the videos. It's a way that you could access so that you get the full experience. All right. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and connect with me. Um, I will, I'm attempting to reach out to you folks, but if you want to get higher on my list, reach out to me and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, my email address is bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. My Facebook is bslatewasa. My phone number is 807-737-1488, extension 2209, which also toll free 1-800-667-3703. A reminder again that June 10th is the last day to submit any of your work, though if you're waiting to submit all of your work at the same time, a reminder that you do have a culminating activity to do. So once you're finished the workbook work that you currently have, uh, you hand that in. You also have a final project that sort of connects all the things that we've been learning this through this course. So it's much more beneficial to get your work in early so that I can mark it and get it back to you. And then you can have that to support you while you're doing your culminating activity. Uh, your culminating activity is something that's sort of like a week or so of time to spend on it. So it's something that isn't going to take you a week solid to do, but you can work on it and then come back to it. It is a larger project, so it's really important to give yourself enough time for it. If you handed everything on June 10th, then you will not have any time to do your culminating. I may give you an extension if you talk to me about it. Um, but it means that you won't get any of your work back. You will definitely not have any work back if you don't hand anything in it until the last week. So just keep that in mind as you are wrapping up these last couple of weeks. I believe it's important to discuss my positionality uh, within the context of this course as being a white person means that I have certain privilege. So I have white set settler ancestry. I have privilege white privilege, and that means that the way that I have learned and been treated within education systems is likely to be very different and very privileged compared to other folks. So I don't want this to affect the way that I teach too much. It is something that I can't escape, but it is something that I'm working on to acknowledge and to disrupt that cycle in order to make spaces more inclusive and accessible to people who are not white and who do not have white privilege to be successful um, and not have to fight against those biases and the discrimination. I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people and uh, consistently work to learn and integrate these teachings into our science class. It is not something that comes super easily to me, but it's something that I'm committed to doing. This is my first time teaching this course, so I do have lots to learn and unlearn, and it is a lifelong journey. Uh, if you have any suggestions of things that I can do to improve this class, I am happy to hear that and we'll work those in. Also, our textbook is very Eurocentric. I've noticed most of the examples are uh, about white communities or white European um, scientists, things like that. So that's ignoring the Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences, and just disregarding that wealth of knowledge and wisdom that is here already, was already here in North America before the uh, Europeans arrived, and uh, continues to be here and thriving. So I think that that's problematic and something, again, why I work to integrate what I can um, though it's something, an area that I'm continuing to learn, learn about and do better. All right, we are now on unit six. We have this unit and then unit seven, and that is the end. So unit six is a really, really short unit. There are only two lessons, and then we will start uh, unit seven, um, which is only, I think, three lessons. So we have very few new material lessons left. So unit six is talking about healthy ecosystems. Since the 1980s, populations of frogs and other amphibians have dropped sharply worldwide. Some 170 species have gone, now gone extinct, 
global warming seems to be a major cause. Tadpoles eat algae that use up dissolved oxygen needed by aquatic organisms. Frogs eat mosquitoes and flies and insect larvae, helping to keep their numbers down. Fish, turtles, larger frogs, herons, and other aquatic predators eat tadpoles and frogs. Land animals such as raccoons, otters, and foxes also eat frogs. Without this food source, their numbers drop. So this is one example of how a healthy ecosystem needs all of its members. When one is just threatened or wiped out, it affects the others. So if there are less frogs and tadpoles, that means the algae will grow and thrive, and that takes up the oxygen that other animal plants and animals in the water need. It also means that they won't, the frogs won't eat the mosquitoes and flies and insect larvae and still be more bugs. It also means that the fish, turtle, and larger frogs and other predators that eat frogs will not have that food source. So it ripples out um, and has a big impact, which then has a big impact on other ecosystems as if there are less herons because there are less frogs and that has an impact on other things or it just, it's a ripple effect. So in lesson 19 today, the importance of biodiversity to the sustainability of life is what we're going to be looking at. So at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to describe the three types of biodiversity and you'll be able to discuss the value of biodiversity to ecosystem strength. You know you've met the learning goals because you can explain the difference between community, genetic, and species biodiversity, and you can explain how abiotic and biotic factors have great impact on the health of the ecosystems. All good if none of that makes any sense yet, that is what we're talking about today. So first, what are the types of biodiversity? Well, first let's understand what biodiversity means. So the variety of different species of microorganisms, animals, and plants living on earth is what is mean, we mean by biodiversity. So just having a diverse set of living creatures whether they are animals, plants, or other microorganisms like bacteria or algae or things like that. So no organism can live without interacting with other organisms or substances. None of us live in isolation. None of us live in a vacuum. Ecosystems include different types of living organisms and a variety of non-living factors. Without biodiversity, whole ecosystems could not survive. All life forms on earth have evolved in response to other organisms and non-living factors. So we, again, because we can't live without each other, we have learned to live with each other. So there are three types of biodiversity on earth. We call them community, genetic, and species biodiversity. So all three of these types are important to sustaining life within our ecosystems. So first let's look at community biodiversity. This refers to different types of communities or ecosystems that exist on earth. Sometimes it's called ecosystem biodiversity. So these are desert communities, swamp communities, fast flowing river communities, communities that exist in places where the river meets the ocean, tide pool communities, uh, forest communities, mountain communities, right? Like uh, prairie communities, all of these different areas where there are different features that sort of define that space, have different communities of uh, creatures, living and non-living plants, animals, etc. So the list of community types on earth is vast and varied. These are only just a few things that I've listed. There are so many different ecosystems and communities that have different uh, plants and animals within them. So then we have genetic biodiversity. And this involves the differences that occur within a single species. So first let's remember a species is a related group of organisms that share a similar form and are able to produce offspring. So genetic biodiversity are differences within those similar species or those species that are similar to each other. So all organisms have genes in the DNA of their cells that store information about inherited characteristics. Sometimes different individuals of the same species have different characteristics. So for example, some orca pods eat seals or other orca whales eat fish. So the idea of this is that for the orca example, means that they're not competing with each other for food source. The fact that some eat fish means 
and others eat seals means that they're not all trying to eat fish. So that means that the greater number of adults reproducing because there's more surviving because they have different food sources than the greater of the variety of genes being passed on and means results in a greater genetic diversity, which means that they are likelier to survive. So genetic biodiversity gives species a better chance of adapting to new circumstances. So as the environment changes, as things change, if there is more genetic diversity, then they are less likely to die off because they're not all going to be affected in the same way. If all the fish are dying because they don't can't eat the frogs, then the orcas that eat the seals are going to survive, whereas the orcas that eat the fish are not. I don't know if there are any orcas that eat fish that eat frogs, but that's just a connection from what we've been saying. So Charles Darwin noticed that different species of finches on the Gal Galapagos Islands have the same common finch ancestor, but they each have a different type of beak. So this I thought was interesting to look at in your textbook to see these exact this example. So each of these different finches have evolved to take advantage of different types of food. Genetic diversity in the common ancestor led to different species evolving. So here, they all started off in the same place. They all started off as a one finch, but you can see that they have different beaks, quite significantly different beaks. And so some of them are, so there's tree finches over here and they eat fruit or insects. Then there's a cactus ground finch. So then there's our finches over here that have some eat cactus, some eat seeds, and their bills do different things. So even like to me, I'm like this bill and this bill don't look that different to me. Um, but these ones are, this one says it's a pear like bill or a grasping bill. So they, how they pick up, how they use their bills are different. Whereas these ones are crushing bills and they crush seeds so they could eat. So the fact that all of these birds have originated from the same place, from the same ancestor, but they have gone through slightly different uh, genetic adjustments means that they're not all competing for the same food type, which means that they are going to survive, they can survive together. And if anything were to happen to all the seeds, all of a sudden there weren't any seeds, and then these ground finches died out because there aren't any seeds, these other finches would still survive because they eat other things. That is the idea, which is pretty cool. And then we have species biodiversity. So species, so this refers to the millions of different species of life in on earth. So there are current estimates for the number of species on earth to range between 5.3 million and 1 trillion. I believe in your book it says uh, 10 million to 30 million, um, but there has been research done since your book was published and conversations about how the sorts of things that were missed out and were not counted. There was in 2011, I think that was listed that like 8.7 million was like, this is the exact amount or roughly, um, but then there was, they realized that they didn't talk about microorganisms, which are things that we can't necessarily see. They're so tiny or even species that live inside of other species um, that would be able to be classified as species. So there are approximately 2 million are recorded, but we think that this is a really, really small portion of all of the number of species that are actually exist in our world. Um, because we haven't discovered every single inch of every single thing and we can't, we can't actually do that. So um, it's a very small, small bit that we do know. But beyond just not knowing that, knowing all of them, uh, unfortunately, Earth is losing biodiversity. So scientists are realizing that we're not going to be able to catalog all of the different species on Earth before many of them become extinct because we, because of the climate crisis, because climate change, things are shifting, animals, plants are being affected before we can even necessarily learn about them. They are being 
wiped out and we don't have a chance to learn about them. Um, so that is just something to, to sort of reflect, reflect on. So here is a diagram that shows the different sort of types of species. So we have plants is sort of one area, but then within plants, uh, we have diversity within there. So we have algae, lichens, angiosperms, ferns and allies, mosses, fungi. These are all different kinds of, uh, of some kinds of plants, right? Those aren't even all of the kinds of plants. Those are just one example of the, of the plants um, within the, within our world. Then we have invertebrates. So we have insects and mollusks, crustaceans, other groups of animals. And then we have vertebrates where we have fish, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. So you can see the, just the extent of um, different types of species that we have and why there's such a vast amount that we don't, we don't know. So that leads us to this idea that we're losing biodiversity, leads us to the idea of the sixth math extinction. So a little bit of history thrown into science today. In Earth's history, there have been five mass extinctions where many species have died out. So the result, they have resulted due to environmental factors. So this could be volcanic activity, sea level changes, ice ages, or asteroid impacts. The last mass extinction was about 65 million years ago when 75% of all species on Earth, including the dinosaurs, became extinct. So this is we, it's something that we sort of think about in terms of uh, the impact of, yeah, we say, we, you know, there's an asteroid that hit the Earth and that changed everything and then all the dinosaurs died out and that's why we don't have dinosaurs. But this was 6 million years ago. So this was a long time ago. And 75% of all the species on the Earth became extinct. So 75% of the things that were living on the Earth were wiped out completely. And that left only 25% to continue to evolve and survive and have become the creatures that are on the Earth today. So that's kind of wild. And this was the last mass extinction. So there were four other ones that happened before that. Now, many scientists believe that Earth is currently going through a sixth mass extinction. So the rate at which species are now becoming extinct is faster than the general rate at which species have died out over the past 60 million years. So we are, as things are dying fast, basically. Um, since the last extinction, new species have evolved more quickly than existing species have died out. This has meant that Earth's community genetic and species biodiversity has increased during that time. So we have more diversity, but things are also dying out faster. However, because of human activities resulting in environmental damage, pollution, and global warming, species are becoming extinct faster than new species are evolving. So we, there was some hope of things evolving and doing well, and, but now because of global, uh, the climate crisis, we are, the impacts of our actions are having, greatly impacting the new species and the health of the species in general. So let's look specifically at species at risk in Canada. So since the arrival of the first European settlers, more than 30 wildlife species have become extinct in Canada. So this isn't just in the last few hundred years, 30 species have come completely extinct. So at present, over 500 plants and animal species are considered at risk. Everywhere in Canada, people are engaged in recovery activities that benefit more than 200 species. So we are aware that these things are in risk and we're trying to work to make change. So just a little bit of language to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, extinct means a wildlife species that no longer exists. It you can't find it anywhere in the world. It uh, alive. Extirpated is a wildlife species that no longer exists in the wild in Canada, but could be occurring elsewhere. Elsewhere, so it could be occurring elsewhere in the world, or it could also be occurring in Canada 
in a uh, wildlife uh, preservation space or a zoo or something like that where it is being taken care of by humans in order to help a uh, hope that they don't become extinct. Endangered is when a wildlife species faces a minim, in, imminent, sorry, extirpation or extinction. Threatened, a wildlife species is likely to become endangered if limiting factors are not reversed. And then there's special concern is when a wildlife species that may become a threatened or endangered species because of a combination of biological characteristics and identified threats. So this is just sort of the scale in terms of paying attention to species that are at risk, uh, both within Canada, but also around the world. So here is a quick video uh, that talks a little bit about what folks are doing. The barn owl, the swift fox, the Newfoundland martin. These are just a few of the species at risk in Canada today because of human activities threatening their habitat. But it's not just wildlife that's at risk. Think about it. Healthy habitats are essential to healthy wildlife and ultimately a healthy environment for us humans. The good news is we can all do things to better coexist with wildlife. It's all about protecting and revitalizing wildlife habitat. For instance, when you're hiking, stay on the trail to avoid disturbing wild plants and animals. When you're shopping, you can help reduce waste by using a cloth bag or a recycled one. In your community, get involved in wildlife habitat conservation efforts. And that's just a start, because individually and collectively, we can all do our part to help species at risk. Find out more at hww.ca. All right, so like I said, super short video that just sort of talks a little bit about what we can do and what we can consider in terms of how to protect these environments and these animals. So there are uh, lists of wildlife species that are at risk. There's lots of different ones here. I grabbed a couple of um, images. I thought I was going to remember these names, but I don't remember the names of these different animals, but these are all different animals that are at risk in Canada. Um, I haven't seen any of these animals, so or plants, um, so I'm not surprised that they're at risk. There is a. Did I not link it? Let me just see if I can find. I had a list to where. No, I guess I didn't link it. Just give me a second. So there's a list of. Um, where you can go and you can find all the species that are at risk in Canada. So you can search or you can just find this list. And it shows you, it lists all of these different animals and it's a long, long list. So they talks about, so there doesn't list any extinct animals. Um, and I don't know if that means that there aren't extinct or if that's just not what this list is about. It shows you the extra, Tripitated species. So remember, these are the ones that are uh, only alive in contained. They're not. Uh, they're not alive in the wild. Um, so they range. So there's the have mammals, which there's a ferret, walrus, and a different kind, and a gray whale. Um, then there's birds, greater prairie chicken. These are the animals that I had. So that is a ferret. Um, this is a ferret. This is a greater prairie chicken. Uh, then there is, I don't remember if this is the, uh, this is the eastern turtle or not, or if it's the other turtle. Oops. There is the paddlefish, different mollusks, different, uh, animals, uh, sorry, insects, and then plants. Um, this is the spring blue eyed Mary. And then they have a whole list of endangered things. So they have the mammals, and then you can continue. You can just see how long that list is. Then birds, and again, so these ones are without, if we don't act, these are gonna become extinct potentially. And then amphibians, 
So really it's across the board. It's not anything, one area that we're doing great and one area that we're doing poorly. Reptiles, fish, and you can come back and you can look at this if you want to look at more specific about these animals um, or plants, mollusks, arthropods, So these are like insects. And plants. So and you can just see how long this list is. Like it's it's surprising. Um, I found it surprising how long this list is. These are more plants. We're only at us. We're getting our way through there, but lichens, mosses. And then they have a whole list of threatened as well. So again, going through the same thing of the, the mammals and birds, amphibians, reptiles, fish, mollusks, amphipods, plants, lichens, mosses, um, and then special concerns. So they have all four, all the various uh, levels. They tell you about you can have this big long list that just shows you all of the different creatures that are um, at risk in Canada. Um, this isn't even in any any other place in the world. This is just Canada. So I will link this in the show notes so that you can, if you are interested, uh, you can check out this uh, the site and you can look a little bit more if you're curious about the animals that are at risk in Canada. So why should we care? really because we're not being threatened um like the, we're not on the list uh so what's the value of biodiversity to humans and the effects of extinction so losing by biodiversity on earth is a serious concern so biodiversity is the key to healthy ecosystems both terrestrial or aquatics on land or in water humans rely on biodiversity to provide them with ecological goods and services Ecological goods and services are benefits gained from the functioning of healthy ecosystems such as food, pollination, and pest control. The goods and services people gain from biologically diverse ecosystems have an econo economic impact. So for example, things that I hadn't really considered, uh, pest control services freely provided by birds in Canada's boil forests are estimated to be worth about $5.4 billion a year. So birds eating bugs, eating insects, eating mosquitoes, eating things that then would eat other plants, of course, would just irritate us. Um, those, that pest control is, birds just do it naturally because they are surviving, but that's estimated to be the equivalent of 5.4 billion. If we don't have those birds, we would have to be investing that much to do the same work that those birds are doing. Uh, also, the value of the food harvested in the boreal forest, such as wild rice or mushrooms, is at least $79 million per year. So accessing wild sources of food, again, is something that we, um, that would have an economic impact if we didn't have access to that. So here are some other examples. So thinking about the the good or the service that we receive from the natural environment from which be due to biodiversity so in terms of food fruits and berries nuts grain vegetables and legumes and animals a diverse diet keeps us healthy so we need a variety of things yes everyone has their own particular health needs but as a entire species we need the variety um, to be the most healthy waste treatment so decomposers help break down biodegradable waste, waterways and organisms living in them act as filters to keep water clean. So if we didn't have decomposers, um, then they would, would mean that a lot of like when animals would die or when plants would die, that would just build up. If we didn't have things that treat those, if we didn't have scavenger animals, if we didn't have fungi or bacteria that would break those things down, um, they would just build up. Soil formation, which relates to the decaying organisms contribute to nutrients to soil. So if we didn't have things to help 
to process those dead organisms, then we wouldn't have any way for those nutrients to go back into the soil. A variety of decomposers help break down organic material into soil. So soil dwellers such as worms ensure soil contains air pockets and is able to hold water and allow plants to grow. If we wipe out the worms, then that doesn't, we don't have access to that service. Production of oxygen. Through photosynthesis, trees and other green plants take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen to the environment. Canada's royal forest has been called the lungs of the north because of the amount of oxygen it produces. So we are super dependent upon plants to not only process the carbon dioxide so that it would not really be bedded, but to create our oxygen or release our oxygen, which we need to survive. Uh, pollination. So worldwide value of pollination services provided by animals in grasslands, rangelands, and croplands is valued at $117 billion per year. If our pollinators are wiped out, we will be significantly impacted. We will not be able to grow our food in the same way that we are currently growing our food. Um, Tis the season for many folks to not mow their lawns and let the original or the early weeds grow and such, and also to not disturb the nests of butterflies and bees so that they can wake up and get healthy and get there be enough food for them to survive because they are natural pollinators and they help us um, so that our food and our plants all grow. Then also pest control again. So just a little bit more of a detailed list. So birds, wasps, spiders, bats, and other animals regulate populations of organisms considered pests. So mosquitoes, mice, ants, um, those things, I really don't want those things to take over. Um, so having these other animals and features that keep those under control, yeah, really benefit from. And then we also have climate regulation. So plants and trees performing photosynthesis take carbon dioxide out of the air and help to keep global temperatures from rising. So not only does this help us from keeping us being able to breathe with oxygen, but also keeping our temperature regulated. And then disease control. Different organisms such as birds and bats prevent the spread of disease carried by pests such as mosquitoes carrying West Nile in Canada. So a quarter of our pharmaceutical drugs are derived from plants. So we are really dependent upon our natural environment and it's kind of mind boggling, mind -boggling when you think about it, how dependent we are upon the biodiversity of our natural environment and how we are not taking care to protect it. All right, so now you should be able to answer your key question on page 157, number one. And so now we want to continue with abiotic and biotic factors. So what is that talking about? So the components of in an ecosystem work together in balance to keep communities healthy. These components include both abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors are the non-living parts of the environment. So the rocks, the water, the sunlight, climate, whereas biotic factors are all living things in the environment, plants, animals. Biotic factors interact with each other and with abiotic factors in an ecosystem to survive. This is that back then, that idea that we don't live in a vacuum, that we're all dependent upon each other. So how does this affect biodiversity? So species are successful when they have all the biotic and abiotic factors they need to grow and reproduce. For example, maple trees need a certain amount of sunlight and good soil to grow tall. When one of the factors is missing or a harmful factor is present, a species success is limited. Its population will stop growing and perhaps decrease. Maple trees in your area might grow more slowly or die if the weather is too dry or if an insect destroys their leaves. So what are some limiting factors? So the factors, so these are factors in the environment that prevent a population of organisms from growing. They might also prevent organisms from moving into another geological area. Living needing factors can be both biotic or abiotic. Here are, is a list from your textbook um, of the different kinds of limiting factors. So both climate and plants, so climate, so this, so no, it's not a cross, it's just a general list, my bad. <laughs> I was thinking that it was a cross, but that's not how it's so very abiotic factors are climate, temperature, precipitation, sunlight, soil, which remember is clay, dry, fertile, infertile, sandy, um, space for species activities, 
nutrients, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus are some examples. Water are all abiotic factors, things that impact the biodiversity of ecosystems. Then biotic factors are plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, viruses, parasites. These are all the living things that are in different ecosystems. And then some limiting factors are scarcity of water or sunlight, absence of prey, too few members of a population to reproduce and pass on genetic diversity. So these are things that are going to limit the success of uh, the different plants and animals or the health of the abiotic and biotic factors. So an important limiting factor for fish, for example, is the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Trout thrive in cool, high oxygen water in the higher parts of rivers flowing into lakes. Walleye and bass can live in less oxygen in warmer, lower sections of the rivers and in the mountain, mouths of lakes. So if either of these change, that means that that's gonna affect these animals. Having them have strengths in different areas means that they're spread out and they're not all accessing the same resources. But if the water temperature or the oxygen level would change, that's going to change who can survive in what parts of the rivers. Then other limiting factors can, for these fish can include individual fisheries, commercial fisheries, pollution, and the introduction of invasive species. So for example, all of these factors have meant declining fish populations in the Great Lakes, which impacts the rest of the lakes ecosystems as well as human populations. Again, the ripple effect. Blue walleye, for example, once abundant in the Blue the Great Lakes, is now extinct there because of such factors as pollution, overfishing, and invasive species. So that talks about abiotic and biotic factors and limiting factors. So hopefully now you can answer question one on page 159. So then we're gonna look at a, key, a quick uh, case study about the Humboldt squid. So the story of the Humboldt squid is one that includes abiotic and biotic factors, limiting factors and the effects of human activities on biodiversity and climate change. Some species are dying out because of pollution, overhunting, loss of habitat because of humans, industries and climate change. Others seem to be expanding their populations and their ranges. The Humboldt squid is an example of one that is expanding. So this is different than what we've been talking about. We've been talking about things that have been extinct and been being killed off. The Humboldt squid is something that is thriving. The Humboldt or jumbo squid lives in the Pacific Ocean. It is a large aggressive aquatic organism that preys on many other aquatic organisms, including other Humboldt squids. Mexican fisheries have called it the Diablo Rojo, the red devil, because it has been known to attack people. So here's an image of it. Uh, it is huge. These are all dead, I'm assuming, because they are not moving. Um, but you can look at videos and you can see just how uh, intense and strong they are. The squid's usual range is from Tierra del Fuego in the southern tip of Argentina to Baja, California. During warm weather years in the mid-1930s and in 1997, the Humboldt squid ventured farther north along the Californian coast than was normal for them. But in both cases, the squid returned to their usual range the next year. Then in 2002, the squid came back to the Northern Pacific coastal waters and they have stayed. So since 2002, so 20 years, they have moved into a new region. So here's an image where you can see where they, this red part is where they naturally were. And then this purpley blue part is this invasive range. So they've gone further south and much, much further north, all the way up to Alaska. Um, in some parts because the water has warmed up and they can, they will survive and have access to a much larger coastal region. Most scientists believe that a change in water temperature caused by climate change has allowed the squid to expand its ter territory. The squid spends most of its time 100 to 600 meters below the surface in low oxygen water. This zone is called the mid oxygen minimum zone. Because of global warming, the zone is expanding towards the ocean surface. With an extended range, both in length and depth, the squid is taking over its new northern territory. Humboldt squid come up to the surface to feed on just about anything that can grab with their two feeding tentacles and pull it into their baseball-sized beaks. Anchovy, hockey, rockfish, sardines, other squid, and shrimp are at risk. 
In BC, some biologists are concerned that young salmon are also falling prey to the squid. This new feeding relationship could potentially reduce the biodiversity of fish species. These squids are just gonna, are doing so well that they're wiping out other aquatic animals. Scientists are, are calling the squid a global warmer warming winter because the limiting factors that once kept them to a certain territory are changing as the water temperature warms up. That's just a really interesting focus of different ways that things can be uh, impacted opposed to just it being reduced, but also something not having the limiting factors and therefore taking over and becoming more of an invasive species than um, just naturally on its own. So let's wrap up what we have talked about today. So our lesson 19 highlights are the, and the importance of biodiversity. So first we talked about uh, biodiversity and what it was and the three different types. So we had community or ecological diversity, which are ecosystem variety present within a geographical area. So the fact that we have different areas that have different ecosystems in our world. Then we have genetic diversity, which is the genetic variability present within the species. So that was the, remember the example of the orcas or the finches that had evolved to be able to feed on different things in order to not be in com competition with themselves. And then we have species diversity, which is the variety of species and abundance of species in our world and how we have a range of millions to trillions of different types of species uh, in our world and how we are all dependent upon each other. I mean, not directly, but indirectly, and we work together. Then we talked about abiotic and biotic factors. So abiotic being non-living factors that have an impact on our biodiversity and biotic being living factors that have an impact on our biodiversity. And then we finally talked about the Humboldt squid as an example of the global warming winner um, or how the limiting factors have been have decreased and that has meant that they've been able to thrive in our current environment, which means that they are taking over and threatening other uh, water plant, uh, plants and animals um, just because they are changing those ecosystems and the biodiversity in those environments which then again has a ripple effect. So hopefully your success criteria, you can explain the difference between community genetic and species biodiversity. And you can explain how abiotic and biotic factors have a great impact on the health of ecosystems. Your review questions are on page 161 and numbers one through eight. So that is a wrapping up for our lesson today. Uh, thanks so much. If you have any questions or concerns, please, as always, reach out to me. You could get a hold of me at 807-737-1488-2209, or you can also call me toll-free at 1-800-667-3703. You can always get a hold of me by email at bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E, at nnec.on.ca. You can connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa. And remember our lessons are uploaded to YouTube also at bslatewasa. Um, then a final reminder that our course is over on June 10th and all of your work needs to be in by June 10th. So please get working and get hands and stuff in so that you can be successful with your credit. I hope you have a lovely day. Thanks so much for joining me, Mwitch.